All right, thanks for your patience. Hi, everyone. My name is Ryan, and I want to talk to you today about schema directives, and in particular, um, custom schema directives, how we might go about using this, uh, what I think is a pretty cool feature of GraphQL to, uh, to achieve some, uh, some neat things with our GraphQL schemas. Quick show of hands. Anybody using any kind of schema directives so far? OK, cool, excellent, a couple of us. Um, so I guess you know maybe this is in a kind of custom way that you're doing this. What I want to go over is kind of some of the newer stuff that we've got with Apollo that allows us to achieve custom schema directives um, more easily than we used to, to uh, achieve it. Um, so like I said, my name is Ryan Chanky. I'm an Angular and Node consultant, so I build a lot of applications in Angular with Node backends. Um, I help out businesses that are kind of just looking to get new technology in, or maybe they don't have any technology at all. Um, I kind of do some business analysis stuff and build them applications. Um, I'm also a Google developer expert, and I teach at angularcast.io. Um, all right, so what is a schema directive in the first place? Well, to answer that, we can go to the GraphQL spec. Um, directives provide this way to do kind of this alternate runtime execution. Um, so we can think about it a little bit like changing the behavior of something at runtime. So um, a good way to think about this is if we have a resolver that resolves with a, a certain piece of data, a certain piece of information, we might want to affect the way that that resolver works at runtime. <clears throat> so with uh, directives in mind, we've got, um, we've got a couple things, at least in the spec. We've got uh, these built-in directives. Um, when we're talking about queries, because we've got directives at the query level and then also at the schema level, um, with queries, the spec talks about the skip and the include directives. So kind of um, you know, hopefully self-explanatory. Skip if there's some condition that's uh, true or false. Uh, include, uh, kind of the inverse of that. And then when we're talking about directives on the schema, the spec really just talks about this one, this deprecated uh, directive. And, um, and it says after that, basically, if you want to do directives, um, kind of it's up to you. Uh, implement it however you want. And that's been, a, I guess, a little bit of a sticking point for a lot of people historically when they want to use directives because there, isn't, like, there hasn't been a super clear-cut way of doing it. There's kind of everybody's reinventing the wheel every time they want to do directives. So before we get too much into how you would actually create one, let's take a look at what it looks like. So here we've got just a simple field. Uh, it's a type string. The field is foo. If we want to use some kind of directive on it, all we've got to do is at sign directive name, just like that. Um, if our directive is to take some arguments, well, we can just pass in an argument kind of like this. Um, so whatever argument is named, whatever value we want to give it, kind of like a function call. All right, so let's take a look at the kind of the quintessential example of a directive. So the deprecated directive. Let's say we've got this, um, you know, we, we've got this type here, this invoice type. Um, and once upon a time, we named a field something uh, that we don't really want to have it named as anymore. So client name here, we want to say that this field should be deprecated. And we provide a reason for that. So what the client is, uh, what the client calling this, um, this resolver is going to get is um, this field uh, should be replaced by something else. <clears throat> so what we'd get if we did the query again, just asking for client instead, is we'd get the actual field we're looking for. So a deprecated directive can be useful, of course, if you want to deprecate certain fields. Um, so beyond that, though, beyond this deprecated directive, kind of the standard one that comes with the spec, what can we solve? Um, basically, anytime we want to, again, change the behavior of a resolver, change, how, change what comes out of it when it's queried. So this is useful for a lot of things. Internationalization is one, uh, one way uh, that we can use them. We can have something set up where, depending on where the user is, depending on their locale, they'll get a different value out that's particular to them. One of the biggest things that I really like is authentication and access control. For those of you who said you're using uh, directives, anybody using it for this purpose? Access control, authentication? OK, a couple hands, very good. I really like it for this. And one of the reasons that I, I like it is because you can get really kind of declarative and really explicit with how certain fields on your schema should behave. So that's a very nice use case. Uh, we've got things like string formatting. So if you want to reformat a string, you know, turn it to uppercase, turn it to lowercase, not sure if you do that a lot, but that's a, a decent use case for directives as well. 
And we've got things like caching. That's another use case. Um, and because when we're working with directives, we're ultimately working with kind of a new resolver for that field, what we can do uh, is do async work because resolvers handle async. So we could do things like we could make a call to some external service. Maybe we could call a REST API and return data from that. So we can get pretty creative. We can do a lot of things with custom directives. So like I said earlier, using custom directives used to suck. It used to be tricky and cumbersome, and because there wasn't a really prescriptive way to do it, there were kind of, it was left up to interpretation. But thankfully, with new things from Apollo that were released earlier this year, it's become a lot easier. So let's see how to do this. Let's go for a visit. And what do I mean by that? Well, with Apollo, we get this class called Schema Directive Visitor. And the idea here is that our schemas are made up of lots of different parts. Um, you know, there's, there's many different aspects to a schema, if you will. And when we're creating directives, it won't always be the case that every part of our schema should be affected or potentially affected by a directive. So what we get is this schema directive visitor class that has ways that we can visit various parts of the schema. And the two that I would say you'll probably use most often if you're implementing custom directives would be visit the field definition, so how the field is actually defined, or visit the object. Those are kind of the two that are most used. But we've got a whole list of others. You know, visit the scalar, visit enum. Anything else that goes into a schema uh, to construct it, you can visit it with the schema directive visitor class. All right, so let's think about this. What are we going to do if we want to take um, this data output that we would normally get, just a hello world string, and we wanted to turn it into hello GraphQL summit instead? Well, here is our very tiny GraphQL setup that would help us to accomplish that first screen. It's got our, our query type with uh, hello, the string type. And then we're resolving just a simple string right, right away out of it. What we would do if we wanted to, um, say, have this directive called replace is we would first tell GraphQL about it. So within our uh, type definition here, just right above our query type, we would first want to say, OK, GraphQL, we want this directive. I want to declare this directive called replace. There's a couple parts to this. I want to declare this directive called replace. That's what I want to name it. Replace should take uh, an argument, and it should be keyed by the name replacement of type string. And where we want that to operate is at the field definition level. So remember, there's many different places within our schema that we can visit, but we probably want to limit it to only the places that we actually want to use the directive ultimately. And in this case, that's at the field definition level. So then what happens? is we can use that directive, again, just putting it beside the field. We can call at replace and pass in our replacement string. And what do we get out of it now? Uh, actually, before we go there, I'll just go to the actual implementation of the uh, schema directive visitor class. It's the kind of last piece that we need, and it's kind of the crux of it. What we need to do is create, we need to subclass schema directive visitor. And if we want to visit the field definition level, well, we would call that method. And we would provide something other than what we would normally get out of this field. So how do we do that? Well, we can call for the argument that we pass in. Uh, remember, at replace, we pass in a replacement string. And then all we have to do is call field.resolve, field give it a new function to resolve with something else. And what we're going to resolve with is the replacement string that was passed in. So we've got our target field definition, we've got the argument that was passed in, and then we've got a new resolver to use if we're going to be calling this directive. And then to make this all kind of tie together, we have to tell Apollo about it. So make executable schema, if you're using that, you would pass in uh, schema directives, and you would tell it about which directives you've got. All right, so at the end of all that, what we get out of it is the hello GraphQL summit string. So again, thinking back to our initial setup, what we've got with our uh, resolver here, this is the initial behavior, hello gives us hello world. But as soon as we tack on the at replace directive, we're going to get some different behavior at runtime, even though our initial uh, schema was, uh, initial resolver was defined in a different way. 
All right, so a cool feature, of course, of uh, directives is that they can be async. So we uh, have our resolvers that are fully capable of, handing, fully capable of handling async. So let's say we've got this situation. I'm not sure if this would you know, be a typical situation that you would want to be getting a list of GitHub users, but maybe you do. And you might have the ID, the login, the avatar URL, and your query is to just call for users. So what if we wanted to make, this, make the call to GitHub, not using their uh, GraphQL implementation, just using their REST API? What if we wanted to make a call to GitHub um, using kind of GraphQL style on our end? Well, what we could do is maybe define something called a REST directive. And a REST directive would give us this at REST symbol to use. Um, the implementation of the directive itself would look a little bit like this. Again, we want to visit the field definition. And maybe we want to pass in something like a method and a URL. So a URL might be the location of the GitHub API to make a call to. And the method, you know, we could pass in like get. Um, and then we would just use an async function this time. So field.resolve becomes an async function. I'm using Axios in this case, passing in our URL and our method, and then just returning the data. Now, this isn't fully kind of fleshed out. There would be a lot more detail that you would probably want to handle here. You know, how do you handle errors? How do you handle when there's no data that comes back? You'd want to be thinking about these things, uh, things like caching, but really simple Im implementation, uh, just you know, for the sake of simplicity, how you would make a call. That's you know, pretty straightforward. It's just async away here. So then we do the rest of the work that we've got to do. Uh, we say we've got this directive. It's called rest. It takes two arguments, method and URL. And again, it operates on the field definition level. That's where we want to use it. So our users field now can take this uh, directive. We just call at rest, give it the method, give it the URL. And just like that, we've got a list of users coming back from GitHub's API. So this can be a cool way to um, start to transition, perhaps, from a REST API towards GraphQL. Maybe you want to scaffold your GraphQL implementation, but maybe you're not fully ready to turn over from your REST implementation. And so what you can do is you can start to describe the schema that you're going to have using GraphQL. And you can make a REST call and have a very simple way to tie into that. OK, getting to the way to use directives that I really like uh, is to do authorization related tasks. So what you get when you are using the resolver, when you're defining a new resolver, is you get the context. So thinking about resolvers as you typically would, we get you know, information about them. We get the context. We get arguments, we get information. And these are all pieces that are useful for various things. Context talks about the request itself. Uh, it talks about things that might be a part of that request, any headers that might exist on it, uh, any other information about kind of the, the request that you might want to go for. So wouldn't it be cool if we could use that to have a directive that checks for authorization information? And so there are many different ways that you can handle authentication, that you can handle authorization. Uh, depending on your setup, it might look a bit different than what I'm going to show you. But the ideas, I think, will carry over. So I'm going to show you uh, kind of a way that you might do this using JSON Web Tokens. Anybody using JSON Web Tokens for their API? All right, very cool. Uh, anybody like definitely using cookies and sessions and sticking to that, not touching JSON Web Tokens? Just curious. You got one guy here? Excellent. Uh, so JSON Web Tokens, very popular. Um, I kind of I don't advocate for one over the other necessarily. I like JSON Web Tokens. I usually use them. But cookies and sessions, perfectly valid way to do it as well. So what if we could get that token on an incoming request and use the information in it to drive the decision as to whether or not the user has access? And what that might look like when it comes time to implement it is something like this. We could have a directive called has scope. And the idea here is that we want to look for a particular scope that's, that the user would have. And this doesn't have to be scope necessarily. You might want to have this be role, for example. If you have like just role-based access control, you can say the user has to be an admin. 
they've got to be a manager, whatever the case might be. But scopes are an interesting way to handle access control because you can get pretty fine-grained. You can start to say things like, the user has to be able to read users as the resource in this case, or they have to be able to write users to get access here. That, uh, that's the idea behind scopes. So what would that look like if we go to implement it? Well, again, we need to visit the field definition. And we want to take the scope that comes in as the argument. And this time, we have to do some extra work, of course, because checking, authentication, authorization, it's, you know, it's more involved than just like, you know, resolving with something right away. So the first thing of note, though, is that we can get the token if it's coming through on the authorization header, which often it does. That's where you would put it uh, in your request from the client. You would stick a JSON web token on an authorization header. You can get that from the context, so just context.headers.authorization. We're doing some work saying, like, if there's no token at all, just error out right away because we can't make a determination about the authentication state. But if the user has the particular scope, that's what we're doing here in this user has scope function, if they have the scope that we're looking for, then we're just going to uh, wrap the resolver, basically, pass through to this context, and that's going to send back um, what the user was trying to get at. If not, if they don't have that scope, we just send back not authorized. So what's happening in the user has scope function? Who knows? I, that's up to you. That, that uh, is probably going to involve verifying the JSON web token. It's probably going to involve reading the payload from it, you know, doing some checks to make sure they have the, the appropriate scope. But if all that passes, then we can just send through the data. And the cool thing about this is that <clears throat> you can start to mark off particular fields that require certain uh, authentication and authorization info. So one of your fields might require read access. One of them might uh, require some other kind of access, depending on how you're doing your auth setup. And if a user makes a query for multiple fields, but they only have access to one, they'll get back an error, but they'll still get back the data for the thing that they are able to access. So there's... There's ways that you, there, there are things you would have to do in your application to account for that and to handle various kind of uh, states, if you will, it, of users being able to access some things and not other things. But it gives us this cool way of being able to very descriptively say what users um, need to have in terms of access control to be able to get at certain things. And the, the reason I really like this is it becomes very readable. So it becomes easy to look at your schema especially if you're working in big teams, to look at your schema and say, OK, this is, um, what <coughs> the, this is what is required to get at this resource. This is what is required to get at this resource. And it's a, it's a very readable, um, it, be, it creates a very readable uh, schema. All right, so that being said, schema directives aren't the only option to solve these problems, especially when it comes to uh, access control to authorization. They aren't the only way to do it, and some people don't like coupling, uh, coupling logic, if you will, directly to their schema. Another popular option is to use middlewares. So there is this package called GraphQL middleware, and this is a useful tool if you want to, if you want to take the logic out of your schema definition and have it be separate. Um, and kind of what it looks like is this you would have um, you know, some kind of like is logged in function that can do some checks for you. And then you just tie, um, you tie your middleware to various parts of your query, and then you pass it in to your, uh, to your schema at the end by applying a middleware. So this kind of removes uh, this tight coupling of logic to your schema and lets you achieve the same thing somewhere else. Um, and some people like doing it this way. Some people don't mind having it tied directly to their schema. But this is another option. This might work better for your situation. All right, so that is actually about it. The slides are available at this link if you are interested. Uh, one thing I would say is experiment with schema directives. There's um, you know, a much easier way to do it now with uh, GraphQL tools. It's if you tried to approach it previously and were kind of a bit put off because it was difficult, it's much easier to do now. Um, and get creative. There's lots of different use cases for them. There's lots of different things you can solve. And uh, go nuts. If you want to find me on Twitter, I am at Ryan Chenke there. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, and we will see you around the conference uh, tomorrow.